The Tom Woods Show, episode 780. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, I've just released another free ebook. This one called Education Without the State. Grab your copy at nostateeducation.com or by texting the word EDUCATE to 33444. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. And guess who's back on the show? Guess who's back on the show after pretty much a year's absence? Bob Murphy, the economist Robert P. Murphy. In a minute, we'll get to why he's been absent for so long, but I'm glad to have him back. Bob holds a Ph.D. in economics from New York University. He's very widely published. He's a super genius. He's the author of many books. He's the author of study guides to major Austrian economic treatises like Man, Economy, and State by Rothbard and Mises' Human Action and the Theory of Money and Credit. His own books include two books in the Politically Incorrect Guide series, Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism and the Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression and the New Deal. He's also the author, most recently, of Choice, Cooperation, Enterprise, and Human Action, which is like a a layman's distillation of Mises' great classic, Human Action. And he's also the author of a textbook for, let's say, late middle schoolers to early high schoolers called Lessons for the Young Economist. You can download that book for free online as well as a free teacher's guide. So it's all kinds of great stuff. Coming to you from Bob, he blogs over at consultingbyrpm.com. All his details will be on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 780. And Bob has just created his first course. Well, not just, but you know, sometime in the not too distant past, he created it. A brand new course for us at libertyclassroom.com, and it's called – well, it's a, it's a study of the history of economic thought going up through Alfred Marshall. And he's going to continue it up through the present for us in 2017, so that's going to be great. Liberty Classroom is sort of like my adult enrichment site for people who feel like I didn't get the real education I should have and I got screwed out of it because all I got was propaganda. Well – If that's how you feel, then head to libertyclassroom.com, and you can take courses by professors who are going to teach you the real economics, the real history, taught by me and by people I trust. This is not the same thing as the Ron Paul curriculum. That's a homeschool project that I'm involved with. This is, although homeschoolers do use it, this is, as I say, more of an adult enrichment thing that while you're driving in your car or whatever, you can be listening to courses by people you know you can rely on. So it is my flagship product libertyclassroom.com. Bob, welcome back to the show. Good to be here, Tom. Love the stuff you're doing. In all honesty, yours is the one podcast that I regularly listen to because I'm kind of an important guy. Well, I appreciate that I make this show for important guys, so I would expect you to be listening because I know you have plenty of time to be listening because you haven't had a whole lot of time to be on the show. In the past year, I think I had you on to debate Vox Day, and so that doesn't really count because you were really on to talk to him, not to me. So it's been quite a while because you and I have been busy with something. We've had our own podcast together. We still have Contra Krugman at ContraKrugman.com. We've done, as of the time people are hearing this, we'll be just about ready to release episode number 60, and we refute the Paul Krugman New York Times column. We pick one of the columns for the week by Krugman, and we refute it, and we have a lot of fun doing it. It's a great podcast everybody should listen to, especially when you say, I wish the Tom Woods show could be a little longer. Well, it can't, but you can get a Contra Krugman episode every week, and that ought to satisfy you, I hope. Yeah, and Tom so, does most of the talking in that one, so it's basically like just an extension <laughs> of the oh, Tom Woods oh, show. Oh, man, is that funny. All right, well, then let's <laughs> – now that we got that remark out of the way, let's turn things over to your course that you did for Liberty Classroom. This is part one of what – I guess will be, are you envisioning a two-part series on the history of economic thought? Right. So the course that's up right now, uh, the subtitle is The Classical Economics and the Marginal Revolution. So this basically takes you up to, but not including 20th century economics. And then yet part two, which we're going to have in 2017, is going to be basically the, the highlights of 20th century economic thought. All right. So what we've done here then in the, um, in this course is you've gone from pre-classical economic thought, really, really early, early people, and you've gone all the way up to Alfred Marshall. 
Now, a lot of people may not know Alfred Marshall, but they will know some of the other names that are covered in the course. For example, Adam Smith, perhaps David Ricardo. You cover Frederick Bastiat, who is somebody who might be left out of a traditional history of economic thought course. Of course, Karl Marx is in here, Karl Menger, and Bombavik is in here too. We'll, we'll definitely get to him because I found it very interesting that you uh, called him your favorite economist. So let, let's start uh, – I don't want to spend too much time on the super early stuff. Not to say that it's not important or that Turgot didn't have a lot of great things to say, but given the, the limitations of time, let's focus on people people are more likely to have heard of. So let's talk about Adam Smith because there has been a little bit of controversy about Adam Smith because Rothbard was very critical of Smith. What do you think are Smith's contributions, and do you think there's anything to the claim that his, his shortcomings were substantial? Well, I think – and I, I said this in the course – I think the deal with Adam Smith is that it's sort of like when people say, oh, my gosh, the Beatles are terrible. I can't stand them. You know, and he's like, Re really, you, you actually dislike the Beatles and you wish they didn't exist? Or is it more that you think they're way overrated and you can't believe that some people think they're the best band ever? So I think there's something of that going on that, you know, the things Rothbard said, I mean, they're all completely valid. And, you know, and we and I recycle some of the the leading criticisms Rothbard raises but I I do think that partly the the uh scorn with which he holds Adam Smith is a reflection of the fact that most other free market economists hold Adam Smith up like he is you know our guru when Rothbard's thinking no there were so many other people particularly in the French tradition that were so much better both in terms of fidelity to free market policy conclusions but also just the you know the cogency of their analysis whereas uh smith was was not a particularly good innovator in that respect that he took us down some some wrong paths as it were so let's give me a couple of examples of something good something bad that we get out of smith okay well certainly uh the good things i mean his discussion of 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 the sort of division of labor right you know smith opens up with this famous thing about the pin factory or whatever and that's that's pretty good exposition of it just to, to get that idea across to the reader because what what smith does is he he has this nice blend of the theory but also um he's supplementing it with sort of real world facts now and, and it makes the exposition nice to read because you feel like okay this isn't just some guy firing from his armchair that he's actually sort of interspersing things with the real world now rothbard has some critiques even on this point saying that a lot of the the numbers and so forth that Smith was giving were out of date, even adjusting for the fact of when Smith was writing. So even that's open up, you know, open to discussion. But I'm, I'm saying in terms of you sitting down and reading it, it is a very interesting um, exposition. So there, there's that element. And Smith's whole idea of the invisible hand, I mean, that, how can you disparage that? I mean, that, that certainly is a way of he, – he wasn't – the first person to come up with that concept, but he's certainly hammered at home the idea that people who don't intend to promote this, the general welfare are acting in their own interest, you might even say acting selfishly or out of personal greed, nonetheless, you know, as long as they're respecting property rights, the market economy directs them to do things that actually benefit, you know, benefit their, their fellow men. That's certainly something that Adam Smith brought to everybody's attention. And, and how can you, um, you know, downplay that? Uh, and he's got plenty of just general critiques of mercantilism and uh, just opening the, the path, of the logic of free trade. So it's true. And I don't know if you want to get into this in this podcast, Tom, that Smith focused on what we would call absolute advantage. But if you're starting out with a, a worldview of mercantilism, that's certainly an important insight to make that Smith pointing out that, look at what's what's smart for an individual household to do can scarce be folly if the kingdom does it. And so in your own individual household, you're not going to try to grow all your own food, make all your own clothes and so forth. You're going to sp specialize in the things that you have the advantage in. And then you're going to sell that to earn money. And then you go to other people. You go to the tailor and buy clothes that he makes because he can make clothes better than you can, for example. And so if that makes sense at the household level, why all of a sudden would that logic break down at the level of the kingdom? Let's talk about – I actually want to move on to David Ricardo. David Ricardo has this famous breakdown where he's classifying people according to what it is they earn on the market. He says landlords earn rent. Workers earn wages, capitalists earn profits. And to some extent, that was later corrected by at least some of the Austrians. So first, I want to know what's wrong with that breakdown. 
And secondly, why does he think that classifying people in this way is the really important economic problem? It just seems like uh, kind of an idiosyncratic question to start with. Well, is I think where he's coming from is that he's picturing the economy as a whole and just looking at the distribution of income. And you know, I, I guess I can't get I can't peel the the layers back too much further and say why is he coming at it that way. That just that is how he's doing it. I mean, if you think about it, even Adam Smith, um, his approach was very. Uh, you could say macro in the sense that he cared about the wealth of nations, right? That's the famous title of his, of his most famous work. So even Smith there is not so much giving us microeconomic analysis, but he's really trying to understand what is it that makes one nation rich and another nation poor. And that's the sort of thing he's focusing on. And so this, and this is part of what Rothbard's problem is with these guys, as opposed to, say, the, the tradition and the French, which were much more focused on subjectivism and um, individual decision making. The British tradition tended to be more thinking in terms of objective features of, of wealth, you know, tangible measures of wealth. Like, oh, we got more production. We got more wheat being harvested. We got more tractors, things like that, as opposed to subjective utility. So that's part of Rothbard's problem with this whole tradition and, and why he doesn't like people elevating Adam Smith um, above where Rothbard thinks he's due. But so back to Ricardo, uh, he's he's more looking at a model of, OK, here's total output, which we know from physical considerations, like this is how much labor we have in capital equipment. And this is, these are the productive powers of the soil, soil. So they all interact to yield this output. And then what principles determine how much of that goes to the different classes of people? So, I mean, part of it is just that the sophistication of their methods back then, they couldn't make the models too complex to break it down much more than that. And that was what what people – that was just the tradition he was, he was working in, and that was a logical extension of it. And so you're right. And we even see throwbacks to that, to our, our terminology to this day, Tom, that – you say, like, well, like, who do you pay rent to? You pay it to a landlord, right? When the average person, if you say, what's rent? He's going to think, oh, that's if I you know, have an apartment, that's how much money I pay every month to the person who owns the apartment, to the landlord. So whereas in terms of modern economic theory, rent is a much broader category referring to the, uh, the period uh, income that a productive factor earns. So a tractor could earn rent. And it's not just that land earns earns rent in terms of modern economic theory, but yet colloquially we still use the term the same way. And people say, well, what is it that capitalists earn? Some people might say profit. And again, that's a, a throwback to the Ricardian tradition. And also you see how this ties in with Marxist analysis. And so that's yet another way that Rothbard and people like that could complain that in one respect, Karl Marx is a classical economist in the British tradition. And so some of what, you know, the framework that Adam Smith, for example, gives us, Marx just took it and ran with it. So obviously Adam Smith was not a Marxist, but I'm saying that some of the the methods of analysis that Adam Smith made popular, you know, that could be used by somebody like Karl Marx, you know, focusing. I mean, there's a sense in which many of the classicals really thought that ultimately labor was the source of economic value. And of course, that tees up somebody like Karl Marx to adopt a labor theory of value. All right, fair enough. Um, you know, obviously, you're, you're, if you're doing a super in-depth treatment of this, which this episode can't be, that's why we have your course, uh, we would talk about Say's Law. But I think we'll leave aside Say's Law. Let's, because any- well, can, can we just say that part of why, you know, why would somebody who's not a professional economist or, you know, someone who's not planning on majoring in economics, but who is a big fan of the Tom Woods show and so on, likes to argue with people on the internet and know economics, reads Mises.org, things like that. Why would they take this course? Because I there's a lot of buzzwords, like people talk about Say's Law all the time, like Krugman might say, you know, oh yeah, these people who who think that's, you know, believe in Say's Law or whatever and didn't realize that Keynes overturned it, things like that. So I think it's helpful if you see w w what are people actually talking about? Because I bet a lot of people did not go back and actually read Jean-Baptiste Say's discussion of this stuff. And I should mention, too, that we it's not just me lecturing in this. we I have the source material so you can read the, what the people actually said in the original. I mean, we, we translated it if they didn't write it in English, obviously. But you can see what they wrote in the original, and then you can see, okay, now how has this 
perhaps been bastardized by people over over the decades since then, because what say said is very defensible. It's, it's pretty straightforward. And it's only later people who said, oh, this is what say meant by his so-called law. And they kind of changed it. I thought you were going to say, well, let's go into it. Let's go into it because it actually is not just an arcane economic question, but it's still relevant today. And I would agree with that. It's just there are so many other things that I do want to talk about. For example, you mentioned Frederick Bastia. You devote a whole lecture to him. That's a name that should be familiar to – or let's just say it might be familiar to, to some listeners, uh, Frederick Bastia, because of his, his, his short book, The Law. But also his strictly economic works are very good, and yet – my sense is that he would not be viewed as a significant figure in the history of economic thought, and that could be because he's not necessarily a strikingly original figure, but it still seems to me that he plays a significant role. So justify your inclusion of Frederick Bastiat and tell us a little bit about why he mattered. Okay, sure. So you're exactly right, Tom, that I don't remember the exact words, but somebody like Paul Krugman, I mean, literally, would... Uh, say that Bastiat is just this hero of right wingers, but in fact, real economists know that Bastiat's just a footnote. He was just a popularizer. He had no real contributions to economic science, and so therefore, you know, anybody who's being objective wouldn't even mention him necessarily in, in a course. And so, whereas I do think it's important to mention him, so he uh, he's developed, I think, in, in the tradition of like political analysis and the theory of of the proper role of government. I mean, you're, you mentioned his work, the law. So Bastiat really crystallized this idea of the function of the government is to defend property rights, you know, to pr- protect people from foreign aggression and so on. And that if the government ever steps outside of that role in itself becomes the aggressor, he starts plundering the people, then that is, you know, completely monstrous that there the government is doing the very thing that it's it's one function is to, pr- to prevent. So Bastiat very eloquently develops that sort of w- what we might today consider to be like a, a, a minarchist position. And so I think it's it's good to go you know, read that and see it in, in his writings and just to, to hammer that home, because for I, I went and gave a, a summary uh, of sort of classical liberalism from an economics perspective to some staffers who were working for particular people at the, in the Texas legislature. And that was, and I just included Bastiat selections from the law because I realized if, they, if they've never seen somebody actually state this position, where better to start than Bastiat? It sort of gives you an idea of, you know, how, how do you start thinking about these things if you're not ready to start with, you know, full anarcho capitalism? You just want to say, well, what would it mean to have principles? deciding how how the government ought to behave and then sort of evaluating from that prism. But as far as economics, I mean, look, there's something to be said for somebody who really crystallizes a position and drives it home. I think this single best essay on free market education ever written was Bastiat's Petition of the Candlemakers. And so if people haven't heard that, I, I definitely encourage them to go look it up, that they it was a, a satirical letter and Bastiat is, is saying the in France, the people who make candlesticks and other sorts of interior illumination, they're writing the legislature saying we face this unfair competition from this foreign entity we can't hope to compete with, and it will just drive out our business, You know, reduce sales, we'll have to lay people off. It's the sun, that the sun just showers us with all of this light during daylight hours, of course, and people would just naturally use the light of the sun rather than burning candles and so forth. And so the proposal is let's force everybody to shutter their windows and keep out the sunlight during the day, and this will boost candle sales and other forms of interior illumination, artificial illumination, and then look at all the benefits that will flow to French industry if we follow this wise course. And so Bastiat very cleverly just takes standard protectionist arguments and applies them in this setting. And then, of course, he ends by you know saying, now you might object and, and think that this is a bad proposal because why should we – neglect this free gift of nature, but you know, you follow these arguments in all these other areas of protectionist legislation, so why wouldn't you do it here? Be consistent. So it's just a, a wonderful piece, and I think you know, far more than looking at regressions and other sorts of, quote, empirical scientific evidence for the uh, efficacy or not of tariffs, just that Bastiat's essay there really hammers it home. Also, the famous uh, broken window fallacy, which a lot of people might think Henry Hazlitt invented. So just in case you don't know what that is, 
the story is there's a kid who breaks uh, the shopkeeper's window. You know, these hooligan kids are, are screwing around and they, they throw a rock and break the shopkeeper's window and a crowd gathers. And, um, you know, at first everybody's mad. Of course, the shopkeeper's mad and they're saying, you know, the kid did something wrong. But then some person who thinks he's very clever says, well, no, actually, there's a blessing here because now it will provide employment since the shopkeeper is going to have to spend money replacing that broken window. So that's going to provide employment. Now the glazier is going to be able to spend money in turn and so forth. Look at the, the ripples of prosperity that will go through our community because of what this kid did. And so a lot of us know that from Henry Hazlitt's treatment, but he got that, you know, and he gives credit, of course, that Bastiat is somebody who um, originally came up with, you know, he's the one who invented that fable. And of course, the point there is to show, you know, you know, something's got to be wrong there. That can't be right. And Bastiat puts his finger on it. The the fallacy there is to think that that, that spending in employment only happens because of the destruction, that if the shopkeeper didn't have to replace the window he could have spent that money paying someone to make a coat for his wife for example so it's just the form of the employment changed but in the case where there's no destruction the community's richer because now they have a new coat and the window whereas when the kid breaks the window they don't have that coat and it just replaces the window so it's showing that you know you don't need destruction to generate employment and you might think oh that's kind of a, a useless thing or you know that's that's old-fashioned but to this day we still have economists, including Paul Krugman, by the way, who've come very close to, who flirt with the idea that, well, even if there's a natural disaster or something, that may be bad from a human perspective, but it is good because it boosts GDP. So it's true that Bastiat did not have innovations in terms of pure economic theory on the level that you know somebody like Ricardo or, or Say did, but just in, even, if, even if the critics were right and he was merely a second-hander, it's, he's a pretty wonderful second-hander, and there's something to be said for that. But I think also there were some uh, you know, minor contributions he made in terms of cleaning up value theory and, and, and things like that. Make the case before we go on for why people can benefit from studying the history of economic thought. I know that within the discipline of economics, it is very much out of favor. You're right, Tom. It is that uh, it used to be – if you were going to get a PhD in economics, at least in American university, well, I'm sure in European too, even more so probably, but I know for sure what I'm talking about when it comes to the U.S., that back in the day, like in the early 1900s, let's say, that yeah, you, if you got a PhD in economics, it was standard that you had to study the history of economic thought. And then they started phasing out that as a requirement. And then it got to the point when I was at NYU, uh, I took it history of economic thought from Israel Kersner, partly just because, you know, I was at NYU and Israel Kersner was still teaching classes. Of course, I was going to take a class from him, but that was a master's level class. I don't believe there even existed a history of economic thought class geared towards uh, PhD students in economics at NYU when I went through. And the, the thinking was, just so you understand why they would say that, is they're like, well, look at we've as we as we continue and progress in our science, we whatever good ideas people in the past had, we retain and the bad ideas we we jettison. And so at any given time, the current state of the theory represents the best from all of history. And so why would you go back and study stuff that was largely incorrect? Why would you do that? So that's the the sort of prejudiced, I would say, modern perspective that thinks now nah, we don't need to waste our time reading stuff from the 1800s. So I think that mentality is wrong even when it comes to the hard sciences. So I think the really good, brilliant physicists, for example, could tell you the various contributions of, you know, oh, this is what Newton did, okay? And then Einstein comes along, and then he got in this fight with Bohr, and, da -da -da -da, and they could go through and, and tell you all the, the contributions people made just because they love their subject and they would go read about it and just be curious, and they're just, you know, smart people. So there's, there's that element, but you could somewhat see the logic of that in the hard natural sciences, whereas in the social sciences, because a lot of that is dependent not on empirical predictions that models generate, and then you go and test the data and see which theories. In the social sciences, that approach does not work, and that's why it's important to have a sound body of antecedent theory, and you can take wrong turns in the social sciences, right? There's not this just a priori guaranteed tendency for this the science to improve over time that's why you know psychology and psychiatry they can go down what i would consider to be the cul-de-sac of freudianism right and they say oh yeah we, we shouldn't have done that or in economics i think a lot of people realize that 
the embrace of communism by many leading theorists was a completely wrong move. Or they, you know, the embrace of uh, Keynesian hydraulic, what's called hydraulic Keynesianism in the 50s and 60s, a lot of economists realize, oh, yeah, that was that was the wrong way to go. And so you, there is this idea that or this this phenomenon that you can see that social sciences can go down the wrong path that we don't really see as much in the hard sciences, because the hard sciences do have that sort of empirical check, whereas with the social sciences, you don't have that. So that's, I think, the the important reason to go look in the past, because a lot of times these insights are overlooked. And so there's a lot of wisdom that you will find in these previous writers that you wouldn't get if you just read. I mean, particularly in economics, and I'm probably preaching to the choir here for your listeners, Tom, but if you tried to read a modern economics textbook, you would not learn too much, in my view, about how the economy works. You would learn a lot more reading something that Karl Menger wrote, for example, back in the 1870s, or certainly Bumbavirk. And yet, you know, so there's, there's something odd to be explained there, and we... I, I've, I've tried to shed a little bit of light on it, that how there's, I think, political influences and so on. You don't have that check. Whereas in physics, if really what you're trying to do is to say which physical theory best explains what this particle accelerator is going to be reading once we run the experiment, whether you're a Marxist or a Democrat or a Republican, it doesn't really matter. The particle accelerator is going to be what it's going to be. In contrast, in economics, if you're a Keynesian, you can look at the Obama stimulus package and say, Yep, it's a good thing we had that because, uh, you know, otherwise unemployment would have been even worse. And somebody like Paul Krugman and I, we can still argue about what happened in the Great Depression because there's not repeatable experiments in the social sciences the way you kind of have those in the natural sciences. So I think that's the issue, in which case your prejudices can sort of guide the analysis. And I think that's why it's important to go back and look at some of these classics. The other thing, just so people know, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to teach – modern economics through the perspective of the development over time. So just by going and looking at these contributions, that that's sort of the approach I'm taking here, that when we look at a particular person, I grab the good stuff and say, this is what this thinker, you know, this was his innovation. And notice how it improved upon, you know, what it was before. So that's the method that, that I use. But I think it's, it's easier to, to build up and get people to realize the benefits of the modern framework that Austrian economists use if you can see where they came from and why it's an improvement. So, for example, you know, the, the classical economists, they had a lot going for them, but they did rely on a cost or a labor theory of value, and that was overturned to what was called the marginal revolution. So in this course for Liberty Classroom, Tom, I spend a lot of time making sure the students understand what do we mean by a cost or labor theory of value? Why would anybody, why would smart guys like Adam Smith have embraced it? What were its problems? And then how did Menger and the subsequent Austrians replace it with something that didn't have any of those flaws? And so that's that's a central part of what I'm trying to get across in this course. I was going to ask you about Karl Menger and the beginnings of the Austrian school, but I think it's just too much to to get to. So instead what I want to do – so in other words, in this course you're going to get an awful lot of material – from economists who lived before there was an Austrian school of economics. And then you're going to see the birth of Austrian economics during this course. Or, you know, I mean, in the course of these lectures, you'll get to that topic. But then I want to get to the man Bob identifies in the course as his favorite economist. And that's uh, Eugen von Bombavirk. Bombavirk is, is Bob's favorite economist. And it's not necessarily because – of the material he covers, although it is partly that, but it's how he covers it and how thoroughly and how persuasively, how good he is at dealing with critics. But when I look at Bombavirk, it looks like a lot of technical stuff about interest theories. So why should the layman appreciate Bombavirk? Right. Uh, so first of all, if you ever see a picture of him, because his beard is awesome. Now, some people might say that's kind of a trivial thing. Perhaps it is, but you still... I can't. I can't neglect to mention I, I, that I have a Bombavirk shirt somewhere around here. I think. <laughs> um, so, just to give background for the listeners, I did my PhD dissertation on Bombavirk. So, you could say I'm biased, but that's kind of the point. Why did I pick this guy? So, I I really do think he is arguably the most in, intelligent economist. Like it's. You know, what I, would you put him up against Mises? I, I don't know. It would be hard for me to decide, you know, who contributed more. I, I guess I might say Mises, but the areas where Mbavrik really shines, I mean, just the, the power of his mind, I cannot 
um, stress enough. And so that's why I encourage people to read it just to see how sharp this guy was. But to answer your question, Tom, it, it's true that he did. He is known, even you know, other economists or whatever, Irving Fisher and so on, credited Bumbavik for really taking the ball forward when it came to understanding capital and interest. But he's also just a very good, he had a solid command of this new uh, subjective value theory that Carl Menger basically invented. All right. And I should say, just in, in case there are people listening who are not completely uh, fans of the Austrian school, that in standard histories of economic thought, it's it's awarded to three different people. It's, it's Menger, William Stanley Jevons, and Leon Walras are all given credit for basically simultaneously and independently just you know, stumbling upon what we now call the marginal revolution and th- throwing out the old cost theory. But I think it, it was best done in the tradition of the Austrians. So Bombavik, you know, reads Menger's book and then says, this is it. I got to, this is what my career is going to be. And I got to follow this to its logical conclusion. So I would say what Bombavik actually did was take the, the new subjective value theory that Menger had developed primarily to explain like what, why is it that steak right now has a higher price than hamburger meat? And Menger explains that. And I think Bombavik said, okay, so why is it that uh, a good available right now has a higher price than a good not available till 10 years from now. And if you explain that, then that explains why interest rates are positive. And so I think that was what Bombavik, that's that's the way I interpret what he did, is he implied Menger's theory in an intertemporal context. So that's why he's associated with interest and capital. But what, and I give some examples in the course, but Bombavik just critiquing other economists who came before him and trying to explain capital and interest theory, Bombavik necessarily has to first teach you just basic economic theory to then ex- to show why these other explanations are wrong. So his his overall goal is to eventually teach you the proper understanding of capital and interest. But he kind of has to first just teach you basic economics in general, like in terms of what, you know, how do you evaluate costs and benefits and things like that. So as far as why I love reading the guy, his rhetorical style, you can it's he'll he'll take his opponent, state the position of the opponent better than the opponent does. And he'll state it so persuasively that you by the time Bombavrik's done building up this position you you agree with it you're like oh yeah that does a, that makes a lot of sense i can see it then bombavrik absolutely destroys it and then he goes okay but maybe i still haven't given you he'll build it up again and then take away the first argument he used and then have a completely independent argument and destroy it again and then so now you're just like oh my gosh this is yeah of course that first view was wrong but you still have some lingering doubt and then Bombavik will say, okay, here's what's going on. This is why you thought that first position was right, but actually see what it was overlooking. And that, and so, I mean, it's by the time he's done, you just have a thorough command of the whole topic. You understand why somebody could hold the erroneous view, and yet now you know exactly what was wrong with it, and then you know the right view. And so by the time you're done, it takes longer to go through that kind of demonstration, but once you're done with it, you just understand that area perfectly. And so he, he just does that time and again, and it's really just amazing to behold. I wanted to ask about Alfred Marshall because of his price theory, but I'm afraid we're, I, I don't want to go too far and too crazy here. But you know what? What the heck, right? We've only been talking a half an hour. Alfred Marshall is the last person you talk about. Now, when you get to part two of the course, who will be, just, you can just give me really quickly, who will be the next person that you pick up with? Um, well, I don't know if it's going to be literally the next person, but very soon after Alfred Marshall, I'm going to spend a lot of time on Irving Fisher, um, for the same reason that I talk about Bumbavik so much is that Fisher is also known as a contributor to capital and interest theory. And, um, so I, I'm definitely going to talk about him. I, I would need, it's, it's partly time a matter of the reason I can't tell you for sure is it, I got to look at how many slots we have and you know we had we have to make some judgment calls so right right there, right no, there's I get scarcity it. yeah there's scarcity even when it comes to liberty classroom content uh, that's right that's right trade-offs need to be made well Alfred Marshall I uh, that's actually believe it or not that is the one video I still have to get to so I assume you spend the time talking about his price theory in there and if that's the case again is there a reason that anybody well, first of all how does his price theory differ from the Austrian, which I hope doesn't take you too long? That's a kind of a, a big question. And secondly, what real-world implications do his deviations from Austrianism have? Okay, so 
Alfred Marshall is just, is huge in terms of the, his influence on modern economics. I mean, he really you know it, it would be a crime to to do a history of economic thought class and not talk about Alfred Marshall. So I mean, for a while he had the the most influential best selling textbook, and that's what a lot of the economists sort of in the you know early twentieth century they learned their economic or at least you know their standard views of economics in in terms of Marshall's treatment. And so what Marshall thought he was doing is is he didn't actually like this idea of the um, the marginal revolution that Marshall thought that yes the these guys after 1871 did bring in some important uh, contributions in terms of utility analysis and subjectivism but let's not throw out all of the tremendous contributions of the classical economists so Marshall thought he was sort of welding those together and this gives rise to what if your listeners know what you have heard the term neoclassical like a lot of times uh, at Mises University, for example, when Austrian professors are trying to contrast the Austrian view with the main, they might say the word mainstream or they might say neoclassical. So that that's partly where that that comes from is that, you know, saying that, it's, yes, we're not literally classical economists anymore, but we're still retaining their insights. So we're neoclassical. So that's that's partly where, where all that comes from. So that's what Marshall thought he was doing. And so one way for our purposes here to kind of boil it down is Marshall famously said that look at these disputes that my fellow economists are having that you've got like the old school classicals arguing that it's objective cost considerations that determine market price whereas you've got these new subjectivists saying no 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 it's all in your mind it's all utility that's ultimately what determines market prices and marshall thought that was silly he said no it's both interacting with each other that it's in our terminology, it's it's supply and demand interacting, and, and Marshall, actually, you know, he popularized the usage of those of those concepts, and he said that to say is it really supply or is it really demand that determines price is like saying, you know, when you're cutting paper with a scissors, is it the top blade or the bottom blade that's doing the cutting? And he thought that's silly. All right, so that that's what I think a lot of people who are just vaguely familiar with it would say that's kind of Marshall's position. And so the Austrians, you know, push comes to shove. It's not that they would deny the use of supply and demand curves as, as being useful, you know, to teach undergrads how to think of something and how to look at the impact of a tax or something. But Austrians think that fundamentally all economic phenomena need to be traced back to the to the mind, that it's all subjective. And in particular, even when you go and draw that supply curve, that's not something that pops out from the raw data. It's not that, oh, yeah, just the amount of coal in the ground determines the supply curve of coal. No, because there are humans who own the coal mines and they make subjective expectations about the future. And depending on what they think is going to happen next year, that might determine how much coal they're willing to sell today based on whatever the price is. Okay, so even when you draw that supply curve, that's not something that's purely due to empirical facts without first going through somebody's mind and being interpreted that way subjectively. So that's that's kind of the, for our purposes here, the way I would distinguish the Marshallian view from the Austrian. And, you know, in terms of real world implications, I think it, a major problem with modern economics is still that it's wed to this notion that things are, are determined in terms of real cost considerations and the subjective facts about the world and supplies and getting away from the essential insights that Menger gave us to say that, no, this, this really is the subjective value revolution and that you need to understand that things need to work through the, the mind of an individual. And so that it sounds almost as a truism to say that sometimes, but that really is a fundamental difference in the Austrian approach. Mainstream neoclassical economists, if you said, oh, we're, we're subjectivists, they would probably say, oh, yeah, so are we. But it, it goes much deeper in terms of the Austrian view that they think both supply and demand are ultimately driven by utility. All right. I'm glad you mentioned the scissors thing. I, that's the thing after not having read anything about Marshall for many years. The only thing I remembered was the two blades of the scissors. So now I now I remember it very clearly. All right. Again, there's a whole lot we can cover, but that's why you have a whole course on it. And as a matter of fact, just this part one course has 23 topics, but 24 videos because of the two Val Ra videos. So you've got a lot of stuff here. For and, and in learning the history of economic thought, you're also learning a lot of economics. 
So it's it's a great thing to know. It's great for cultural literacy. It's great all around. So I hope you'll check out libertyclassroom.com. It is, as I've called it, my flagship product. I'm glad to welcome Bob as one of our faculty members on there. Bob, thanks for doing this. I don't want to pester you, but at the same time, I'm going to pester you about getting uh, the the second part of this course up and running because I think people really want to sink their teeth into, well, Keynes more than anybody. And given that Rothbard didn't live to do that in his published history of economic thought, well, it falls to you, my friend, and we're looking forward to that. Well, thanks, and I appreciate the opportunity. Also, one of the things I'm looking forward to is uh, my field that I declared at NYU was actually game theory. And so there's a lot of good stuff uh, for those who caught my presentation for the Mises event uh, in Fort Worth recently. I talked about arrows and possibility theorem. So like we're going to cover that in the course. And just to show, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of neat things in this realm that I think pertain to an Austro-libertarian worldview, but for, for you know, better or worse, I, I there's a lot of this stuff that I'm able to teach because I learned it at NYU, and just to you know have the formal analysis, and then to be able to step back and say, okay, now from sort of Rothbardian perspective, how do we how do we examine these things? Well, that is, uh, I'm looking forward to that very much. As our uh, our existing members at Liberty Classroom, there they. They want whatever whatever you're putting out, and they, they can't wait to uh, to watch those. So thanks so much for doing it. Uh, don't be such a stranger on the Tom Woods Show, but I will talk to you in a couple days for the next episode of Contra Krugman. Great. Thanks for having me, Tom. Keep up the good work. Okay, boy, do we have a juicy one coming up for you tomorrow. But first, let me tell you about another website started by a Tom Woods Show listener, and that is libertariannerds.com. I don't know, is that uh, redundancy? Libertarian nerds? Oh, who would say that? What a terrible thing to say. Libertarian nerds, the tagline is saving the world one nerd at a time. Lots of interesting, there's a podcast they have, and lots of interesting topics covered. For instance, what would you do about the military when you have uh, anarcho-capitalism? How would you have military defense? But also things like how do you deal with children's rights? and yet at the same time not fall into the idea of positive obligations and positive rights. This has been a tricky puzzle for libertarians in to some degree, and the libertarian nerds try their hand at it. They've got a, a great post about Rothbard, all kinds of great stuff over at libertariannerds.com. You're going to love this site, so check it out. If you are starting a site, make sure you use my special link, to get your hosting, and I'll mention you on the show, give you a nice, juicy, SEO-rich backlink, two dozen video tutorials to help get you started, and membership in my private bloggers group. All these bonuses are yours for nothing, as long as you check out tomwoods.com slash publicity and get the details there. All right, tomorrow, your old friend Scott Horton comes back to the show, and we are doing, and originally we are going to do an episode on Yemen, because Scott's been telling me Yemen is totally overlooked by everybody, and it's horrible. People need to know what's going on. That was our original plan. Then when Trump got elected, for some reason I said, you know what, why don't we do instead an episode that would be the equivalent of the Scott Horton Donald Trump briefing? What would you say to the incoming president to brief him about the state of American foreign policy and what should be done? That's going to be a ton of fun, episode 781. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.